tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's edition, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with two audio adaptations of frightening fiction about clever corpses and malevolent memories. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is proudly brought to you by June's Journey. Friends, when you think back on my long and illustrious life, the places I've traveled, the women I've loved, and no less, the mobile games I've played, there's been no game more evocative of it all than June's Journey. Back in my detective days, before I traded my trench coat and fedora for a microphone, jet-setting around the world searching for clues, I knew this June Parker. Many of them, in fact. You see, as sleuthy and elusive as detectives tend to be, those in life will inevitably gravitate toward one another. And whether I was lifting fingerprints off some bar in a Parisian parlor, or following footprints down a dark alley in New York City, I'd always managed to meet the June Parker of the evening, sometimes several evenings. We'd know better than to ask each other's names, of course, so to me, they were all June Parker, and I like to think I was Steve Taylor to all of them. I remember those days fondly, and that's why I'm so excited about June's journey from our friends at Wooga. It's a murder mystery slash hidden object game set back in the roaring 20s with all that era's charm and aesthetic. You and I play the part of June Parker, amateur detective investigating a murder it's an immersive dive into a world you don't want to leave, and best of all, you can download it right now for free. June's Journey will have you collecting evidence and solving mysteries in endlessly beautiful scenes from all around the world. It's a brain booster, testing your observational skills and putting your power of recall to the test. With every level, you collect coins and rewards, earn upgrades, and unlock new scenes to explore. It's the rare breed of a game that keeps you glued to the screen you'll always want to play just a little more. My favorite time to play June's Journey is in the morning. There's nothing like a hidden object hunt to get the day going and the brain going. But it's also great at night to wind down. In essence, I wake up a detective and I retire a detective. <laughs> in between, I see all the details the common person overlooks. It's a mindset, this life of detecting. Take it from me, I notice everything. Nice haircut, by the way. Looks like they missed a spot, though. But never mind that, friends. We've got a mystery on our hands. It's time to dust off that old magnifying glass and join the rapidly growing community of over 30 million June's Journey fans. Immerse yourself in a glamorous era full of danger, mystery, and romance. I'll be there, too. Who knows? Maybe we'll run into each other. Ready to awaken your inner detective? Download June's Journey free today on the Apple App Store or Google Play. Thanks for your support and for supporting our valuable sponsors. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, 
and tonight I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of Alexander H. and Buzz Parcher are voice talents Kyle Stroud, Jesse Cornett, Heather Thomas, Melissa Medina, Creepy Face, Paul J. McSorley, and Eric Peabody. Now, get your ticket ready. Take your seat in our theater of the minds and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Our first story tonight is written by Alexander H. and is performed by Creepyface, Paul J. McSorley, and Eric Peabody. In it, we will meet a motorist who accidentally hits and kills someone on a dark, isolated road in the middle of the night. In a comically supernatural turn of events, the corpse talks to the motorist afterwards and gives the motorist advice on how to get away with the crime. Without further ado, I present to you, Christopher Fell. It was a dark New England night. Even in the clear, there was no moon. But the road that wound through the woods had so much tree cover that even starlight had no chance of shining through. Nor were there any street lights on a road this isolated. And as for signs of civilization, Christopher Fell had seen only a few houses during his drive, and those were few far between and tended to be either in the distance or hidden behind trees that surrounded him. He had his headlights, of course, and they were working fine enough, but outside of their limited scope, the world seemed to be made of black. Normally, driving at night didn't bother Christopher in the slightest. He was used to it, actually preferred it to the busy traffic and glaring sunlight of daytime drives. Christopher had never been much of a sunshine person, much to the amusement of the friends and relatives who liked to jokingly call him a vampire. He was no vampire, of course but that didn't stop his friends from making fun of his night job and his resulting tendency to sleep during the day. Christopher himself was alternately amused and annoyed by the vampire jokes, but, and here I realize I may have strayed from the story a bit, the point is that Christopher was used to driving at night. Normally, it would not be an issue but Christopher was also used to driving through the suburbs, not through such a wooded area, where there were no other light sources at all. Christopher was also used to driving while much more alert than he was right now. He had been up all Friday night at his security job, and then been struck by an annoying but not unfamiliar bout of insomnia during the day, unable to sleep so much as a wink. He really should have begged off when his buddy Frankie had suggested going to a party at Frankie's cousin's house the following night, or at least made sure to get a nap in, or something. But Christopher had had no idea that Frankie's cousin lived so far from town, but perhaps even if he had known, he might have still agreed to go to the party, for he had felt surprisingly alert on Saturday evening despite the fact that he hadn't slept since Friday afternoon. Now driving home from the party, down the dark, winding road in the middle of nowhere, Christopher glanced at the clock on the dashboard and saw that it was now two o'clock in the morning. He did a bit of calculation and realized it had been roughly 33 hours or so since he last slept. Can that be right? He thought. Let me see. I woke up Friday afternoon at about 5 p.m., went to work all night, couldn't sleep all day, went to the party, party went late, yep, a bit over 30 hours, oh, no wonder I'm wiped. 
he still felt safe to drive. But his eyes felt awfully heavy, and Christopher, perhaps a bit more desperate than he realized, rationalized. If I close my eyes for just a moment, that might be all I need. Not even ten seconds. Just a moment. After all, the woods, which had been remarkably thick, were clearing up ahead. They rather suddenly stopped, in fact, revealing nothing but large meadows on either side of the road. Christopher was still debating on whether to rest his eyes for a moment, when his eyes, rather involuntarily, made the decision for him. He didn't exactly doze off, but he did close his eyes. Christopher would later swear it was just for a moment. He was startled awake. No, not awake. That would imply he had fallen asleep for a moment. And Christopher just would not admit that was so. When the car hit a surprisingly severe bump in the road, just as his car was emerging from the woods, the steering wheel suddenly jerked to the right, almost as if in protest to whatever the car had rolled over on the street, when Christopher suddenly found himself driving on the grass on the side of the road. Christopher tried to compensate by jerking the wheel back to the left, but before he could act, he was distracted by a flash of movement. At first, he didn't know what it was, and the next thing he knew, the car slammed into a tree in the meadow. Christopher was thrust forward, his life undoubtedly saved by his seat belt, but his head slamming into the top of the steering wheel. Son of a bitch! Christopher exclaimed. Dazed, he looked at the driver's side and passenger windows and saw that, as far as Christopher could see in the darkness, he had struck the one and only tree in the entire meadow. If his car had gone in any other direction at all, he would have been absolutely fine. Just my damn luck, Christopher griped. He supposed he could just drive off. He didn't think the car was damaged that badly, although there was surely a nasty dent in the front. But his curiosity got the better of him, and he wanted to visually inspect just how bad it was. He turned the ignition off and removed his flashlight from the glove compartment. He opened the door and stepped out of the car. An instant before, he shone his light towards the point of impact between the car and the tree. He suddenly remembered that he had seen a flash of movement just before the collision, and for a moment, he wondered if he had hit a deer. Then, his mind finally clicked into operation, and he realized what he was looking at. A person. He had hit a person pinned between the car and the tree at an angle that somehow hadn't been visible from the front seat was a young man, not much older than a teenager. Without thinking, Christopher instinctively gave the car a good shove, and perhaps he had accidentally put the car into neutral at some point during the accident. That was somehow enough to move the car a foot or two away from the tree, just enough to allow the man that had been pinned to tumble to the ground. From his prone position on the ground, the young man's eyes rolled to look up at Christopher. Well? The young man said, eerily not moving a muscle other than his mouth when he talked. Well, looks like I'm dead. And not to sound harsh or anything, but yeah, it's your fault. You killed me. I'm sure it was an accident, but yeah, I'm dead. And yeah, you're the one to blame, no two ways about it. No, 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 Christopher replied in both disagreement and panic. No, you're all right, you're fine, of course you're not dead, or you couldn't be talking. Don't worry, you're gonna be okay, I'll get help. Sorry, bub, but yes, I am dead. Check my pulse if you don't believe me. Not sure about the talking. Maybe that's only your imagination fueled by a guilty conscience. Or maybe it's something supernatural. I don't know. The first explanation is usually the best. This is insane, Christopher protested. The man claiming to be dead finally moved something other than his eyes and his mouth. He raised an arm, as if in defiant offer for Christopher to feel his pulse. Christopher took the man's wrist and sure enough, couldn't find a pulse at all doesn't mean anything, Christopher declared, 
quickly letting go of the man's wrist and allowing the man's arm to clumsily plop to the ground. Christopher squatted down and put two fingers on the man's neck, like he'd seen people do in the movies. No evident pulse there either. Told you, I'm dead. This is impossible, Christopher insisted. It can't be happening. Afraid it is, friend. Listen, I don't hold a grudge. I know it was your fault, but I have no doubt in my mind you didn't mean to hit me. I, I didn't. I didn't, I swear. I was just so tired and the car hit a bump in the road and I lost control only for a moment. And what are you doing out here in the dark in the middle of nowhere anyway? I like to wander outside at night and do some stargazing, the dead man explained. It's not the middle of nowhere from my perspective. You probably can't see it from here, what with the lights off and all, but my house is just beyond the tree line on the far side of this meadow. This meadow is more or less my backyard, I guess you could say. This is madness, Christopher insisted. You can't be dead if you're talking to me. Oh look, let's not get into that again. I don't know the reason for why it's possible and do you really even care? I'm dead and I wish I wasn't, but it's too late for that. You've got to do something about it. I'll, I'll call the police, Christopher said, reaching into his pocket to retrieve his cell phone. He pulled his phone out and hurriedly entered his password to turn on the screen, but before he could start dialing 911, the dead man protested. What are you crazy? I'm already dead. There's nothing you can do about that now. Listen, if you calling the police could somehow do me any good whatsoever, yeah, I'd want you to call them, right here, right now. But what good is that going to do? Well, but it's the right thing to do, Christopher pointed out. By the strictest rules of law, and maybe, I say maybe, by the strictest rules of morality, I suppose you could argue that it's the right thing to do, but again, what good is it going to do either of us? Look, do you like your life? I mean, are you happy? I don't mean right now, of course, this is a terrible time, I know, but I mean, in general, are you happy? Well, Christopher said, hesitating, thrown off by the sudden change in the conversation's direction. I don't know about happiness, I guess I'm not exactly unhappy, I'm content. I guess it's the most accurate way of putting it. Okay. And what's going to happen to that content little life if you call the police? Just stop and think a bit. What's going to happen in the aftermath? But what are you saying? Christopher demanded. I can't just drive off. No. The dead man admitted. With that I agree. You gotta hide the evidence. Are you insane? Christopher protested. Look. The dead man continued. I don't think there's any blood on the car. Sure a dent where the car hit the tree, but no evidence that you actually hit a human being. But if you just drive off, even on a road this isolated, someone's eventually going to drive by and see a dead body by the side of the road. That's going to raise questions. The police are good at this kind of thing. They find a dead body, trust me, sooner or later, they're going to find a way to track down the killer. You have to hide the body. I can't believe this. Believe it, the dead man said. I'm telling you this for your own good. Again, if calling the police or letting my body be discovered could do me any good, I wouldn't be giving you this advice, but face the facts, man. Hide the body or your life is over as you know it. How am I supposed to hide a body? Christopher demanded. First things first. Grab my wallet. It's in my front right pocket. Well left pocket from your current angle. Why do I need your wallet? Christopher asked, more confused than ever. Two reasons, the dead man responded. First, I can't have you continuing to think of me only as the dead man. It's insulting. I have a name, you know, but you'll never know what it is if you don't check. Second, there might be some cash in there. I don't remember, but this has turned into a hell of a bad night for both of us and you might as well get something out of it. Christopher saw the logic in the dead man's reasoning. So he fished the wallet out of the dead man's pocket and flipped it open to see a driver's license and the flashlight's beam. Matthew Edwards, Christopher read out loud. Just Matt is fine. Okay, Matt, 
Christopher said, casually taking a wad of bills out of the wallet and stuffing them into his own pocket. How do you propose I hide a body? I don't suppose you have a shovel in the trunk of your car by any chance? Matt asked. No, Christopher said, feeling inadequate for not having the shovel. Too bad, Matt said, clearly disappointed. Well, next best thing, drag me over to those woods over there. Out here in the meadow, I'm out in the open. Anyone passing by would clearly see me. Drag me deep enough into those woods. It'll be easy to hide me in the underbrush. You wouldn't even have to bury me. Nobody ever goes into those woods, except to occasionally drive on the through road. Just drag me far enough from the road so that no one can see it from there. Well, you were out here, wandering around, Christopher pointed out. If you were out here, doesn't it stand to reason that somebody else... No, man. Matt disagreed. Listen, I know this whole area like the back of my hand. The closest neighbor is like a mile away. Even if they like to wander around outside, they're almost certainly not going to wander this far out. I'm telling you, hiding me in the bushes in the woods will be enough. It'll be fine. Christopher sighed, but supposed that Matt was right. He grabbed Matt's limp body under the arms and dragged him towards the woods. You know, this being dead thing's really not so bad. Matt said out loud, but more to himself than to Christopher. I never really thought about it before, but now that I'm dead, I don't see what the big deal is. This is what everyone's so scared of. It's actually pretty relaxing. No responsibilities, no worries. Hell, I don't even have to move. I guess you couldn't even if you wanted to, Christopher replied. True, that's true, Matt said with a laugh. The further they got from the glare of the car's headlights, the harder it was for Christopher to see. But he eventually got to the tree line and re-entered the woods he had just driven out of. He knew this less from what little he could see, and more from the fact that he could now feel plants and weeds scraping at his sides of his legs, and could hear the crunch and rustle of dead leaves under his feet. He continued to drag Matt's body deeper into the woods until he started to get out of breath from the effort. That's all right, Matt said good-naturedly, as if he could sense that Christopher was starting to get tired. This should be far enough. There's no way anyone will find me now. Okay, if you think so, Christopher said. He hesitated for a moment, but couldn't quite figure out why. So he let go of the body, and Matt fell to the ground with a quiet thump. Now what? Well... Matt said, clearly taking the time to consider his answer. I guess that's it. That's it? Christopher repeated, still trying to process everything. Yeah. Matt said, now with more confidence. Nothing else really to do, I guess. Might as well go on your way. So, Christopher said, still hesitant to leave, and still not quite sure why. I guess this is goodbye. Bye, Chris. Matt said. Take good care of yourself. Drive safe. You too, Christopher said before realizing how stupid that sounded. I mean, you know. Bye. Christopher wasn't sure in the dark, but he thought he saw Matt give a friendly little wave of his hand. Christopher waved back, feeling foolish for doing so. But hey, it was an awkward situation. He walked back to the car shown his light on the front again, and decided that his original determination had been right. The car really wasn't hurt that bad at all. Dented, but still easily drivable. He got in his car, closed the door, turned off the flashlight, and put it back in the glove compartment. He drove for another half hour or so, sometimes in silence, sometimes with the radio on, Gradually, signs of civilization started showing up. A crossroad here, a house, or some other building there. Eventually, he arrived back in town. He pulled into the parking lot of one of the very few public buildings open this time of night. The local police station. He had made a decision during the drive home. He would turn in the dead man's wallet. He would claim that he found it by the side of the road or something, if anybody even asked. It was a small gesture, but he figured it was the least he could do. Good evening, 
Christopher said to the officer on duty at the front desk. I was driving home tonight and I saw this wallet on the side of the road. I didn't feel it would be right to drive up to the house in the middle of the night, so I thought I'd return it here. I'll take it and have a patrol car drive it over to whoever owns it in the morning, the officer said. Christopher handed the wallet over and took his cell phone out to type his address into the GPS. At some point during all the excitement of the evening, the GPS function had somehow turned off, but it had now been a very long time since he'd slept. His eyesight was blurry and his mind just wasn't thinking right. Do you know how to access GPS on a smartphone? Christopher asked the police officer. I just can't get my mind working right now. Are you sure you should be driving? The officer asked, giving Christopher a stern look of warning. But still, he reached out a friendly hand and took the phone to try and figure it out. Hey, did you know your phone is in record mode? You've got a really long video on here. I... Uh, what? Christopher said, barely understanding the officer's question. All Christopher knew was that he was, no pun intended, dead tired. He just wanted to sleep. Yeah, here, see? The officer said, pointing the video out. You've been recording everything for God knows how long. To prove what he was saying, the officer hit the play button. Expecting to see the usual meaningless shaky cam visuals that occur when someone accidentally turns on their phone, the officer was shocked to see what looked like a dead body lying between a tree and a car. And this is what both the officer and Christopher heard on the recording. Well, but it's the right thing to do. Christopher pointed out to Matt on the recording. No voice responded. Indeed, all they could hear was Christopher talking to himself. Well, Christopher's voice continued on the recording. I don't know about happy. I guess I'm not exactly unhappy. I'm content. I guess that's the most accurate way of putting it. But what are you saying? I can't just drive off. Are you insane? I can't believe this. How am I supposed to hide a body? Why do I need your wallet? Matthew Edwards. Okay, Matt. How do you propose I hide a body? The police officer turned the sound off and glared at Christopher. What the hell is this? Because I'll tell you what it looks like. It looks like you hit somebody with your car and then recorded a confession. So what the hell is going on here? He actually proposed a couple of different possibilities. Christopher explained. First, he said it might be my guilty conscience talking to me. That was his first possible explanation. And he said, the first explanation is usually the best. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is brought to you by BetterHelp. You should never judge a book by its cover, listeners. You know that better than anyone. But what may not always occur to you is this also goes for people. Take my cover, for instance. Virgin Wool Armani Suit. Shoes by Salvatore Ferragamo. Brunello Cuccinelli Cotton Twill Shirt. The tie, Prada. Underwear by Hames. X-Temp, if you must know. An illustrious cover for sure, even for a podcast host. But now that you've judged me, I'll show you the error in your ways. I'm not the cocksure big shot I appear to be. Not on the inside. Inside, I'm just like everyone else. The same insecurities, the same inadequacies, the same issues as anyone else. This hand-stitched, double-breasted jacket is no more than a suit of armor protecting the delicate, sensitive heart of a vulnerable man. Hell, since we're being honest here, I didn't even pay for this stuff. I stole most of it, but I did that so people would think I had my life together. At the time, it made sense to me. Now, I'm not about to return any of it, but the point is this. If I knew back then what I knew now, none of this would have been necessary. The best way to deal with our deep-seated mental issues isn't robbing funeral parlors. It's not knocking over department stores. 
It's professional online counseling from BetterHelp. BetterHelp is the easiest, most convenient way to enjoy the benefits of therapy. Whether you're dealing with depression, anxiety, kleptomania, or any personal problems at all, there's a counselor at BetterHelp just waiting to talk them over with you. This isn't self-help, friends. It's an actual therapist with an actual license who is prepared to give you actual good advice. Here's what you can expect when you sign up. Within 48 hours, you'll be chatting with someone who specializes in your specific needs. You can reach out anytime and receive timely, thoughtful responses. You can schedule weekly phone or video sessions at your convenience. You can even message your therapist ahead of time to let him or her know what you'd like to discuss during your next session. It's really something special that BetterHelp does. Less focus on formalities, more focus on results. Not to mention zero time wasted in an uncomfortable waiting room. But can you afford it, you ask? You'll be happy to know it's more affordable than traditional therapy and there's even financial aid available. I mean, over one million people have used BetterHelp to deal with their mental health. So many, they're recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. So let's all get our lives together, shall we? I want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com slash chilling. Join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash chilling. Thank you for your support and for supporting our valuable sponsors. I hope you enjoyed Christopher Fell, as written by Alexander H. and voiced by Creepy Face, Paul J. McSorley, and Eric Peabody. You can hear more from Creepy Face right here on our very own network, as well as on his YouTube channel called by the same name. He has worked so very hard making a career out of voice acting and his love for horror. And with his talent, we just had to have him on our team. I implore you to check him out, please. Help us welcome our newest Chilling family member. You can hear more of Eric Peabody on the Chilling Tales YouTube channel, where he holds the second place championship title for 2019's Evil Idol competition. You'll also find more of his work on his website at www.vikingguitar.com. If you check him out, be sure to give him a thumbs up and leave a kind word whenever possible and tell him you heard him here on this program. It means a lot to us. Voice actor Paul J. McSorley's talents can be found on our very own Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, as well as on past episodes of the Simply Scary podcast. You can also keep up with him weekly on his new show, Fear from the Heartland, which will debut in podcast format in early 2022. Meanwhile, capture the magic or the madness <laughs> from the very beginning and check out his show on our YouTube channel today. You'll be glad that you did. And after dropping by, don't forget to let him know you heard him here on this show. Our second tale of the evening is written by Buzz Parcher and performed by Kyle Stroud, Jesse Cornett, Heather Thomas, and Melissa Medina. In it, we will meet Greg, a man forced to move back to his hometown and into the house he grew up in. He never told his wife or children about the horrific murders he witnessed in that house when his dad used an ax to murder his dog, mother, and sister. The story flashes back to the murders in detail with unexpected results. Now, without further ado, I present to you, Lucid. Be careful with that, sweetheart. That might be too heavy for you to carry up the stairs, Greg yelled at his teenage daughter, Cassidy. She, of course, wasn't listening and was struggling to get a heavy box through the front door. The moving truck was parked in front of the house where Greg had grown up. He never thought he would come back to defiance. There he was, moving his wife and kids into the home he 
never wanted to see again. Greg had been with his wife Jasmine for 18 years. He had never told her about the horrors of his childhood, and he never planned to. As far as anyone else knew, his parents and sister died in a car accident. The house was transferred into Greg's name when he turned 18. He paid a local guy named Randy for the upkeep. Randy performed regular maintenance on the house and took care of the landscaping, but no one had lived in that house since the incident. Jasmine would ask Greg, from time to time, to either rent or sell the house, but each time she brought it up, Greg would lose his temper and tell her to never talk about that fucking house. Greg was a fantastic guy, and the house was the only thing she ever saw him lose his shit over. When Greg lost his job out in Phoenix, he struggled to find work. He couldn't believe his terrible luck in finding adequate employment in a city so big. An opportunity arose in his tiny Ohio hometown, where he coincidentally owned a home. Jasmine convinced him it was a sign that they should move. Greg watched his preteen son Carter run around in the yard with the dog, refusing to do anything that resembled helping. Greg smiled and leaned on the hydraulic gate of the moving truck. He had sworn that if he ever came back to this town, it would be to burn this fucking house down, not live in it. Who knows, Greg said only to himself. Maybe this will work out after all. It's just a goddamn house. Jasmine looked back at him daydreaming and yelled for him to hurry up. We are just getting started, babe. Look alive. He grabbed the furniture dolly and wheeled their antique dresser up the sidewalk. In 1994, Greg and his big sister Nikki were sitting on the family room floor in front of the television watching The Simpsons. Their mother was Tammy, a young woman in her mid-thirties. She was sitting on the couch with a cold beer between her legs, half-heartedly watching the TV and trying to read a book. No one was paying attention to Carl, who was sitting at the kitchen table with their past-due bills spread out in front of him. He had been drinking Jack Daniels to try and calm his brain. They were in deep shit financially, and Carl was the only source of income. The family dog was named Sparky. Sparky had been whining at the door for some time now, waiting for someone to take him outside. No one was paying attention to him either, and when the dog cocked his leg and pissed on the floor, Carl finally snapped. He slammed both his fists down on the table and screamed, God damn it, you fucking dog! Carl stood up out of his seat so fast his chair flew backward into the refrigerator. He grabbed Sparky by the nape of his neck and lifted him with one hand. Sparky yelped once as he was caught, and then another time when Carl threw him across the kitchen into the wall. The rest of the family stopped watching the TV and watched in disbelief as Carl kicked the dog twice in the ribs. Carl had both hands on the wall, leaning over the dog. It was breathing hard and whimpering with every one. I'm sick of this fucking animal disrespecting me in my house. Carl snarled drunkenly. He turned to his wife and kids, pointed his finger and screamed. No one in this house has any respect for me. Tammy had never seen that look on Carl's face before. His face looked distorted, like an artist's rendering of the boogeyman had come to life. He seemed like someone, or something, else altogether. Tammy pushed the children behind her and tried to reason with her husband. Calm down, Carl. I don't know what's gotten into you, but whatever it is, we can work it out. Please, talk to me. Fuck you, you fucking bitch! Saliva webbed between Carl's dry, cracked lips. His mouth sounded full like he had cotton balls shoved in his cheeks or his tongue was swollen. His voice was thick and abrasive as he struggled to get the words out. You're the worst of them all. It's always up to me to fix the problems around here. And right now, this dog is a fucking problem. Carl picked up the dog and took it out back where he would typically chop wood for the fireplace. Sparky continued to whimper 
as Tammy and the kids followed Carl out the back door. Carl laid him down on the tree stump and grabbed his axe. He looked at his family and pointed the axe at them. Frozen with fright, all they could do was watch. This is what happens! <laughs> Carl growled and coughed, then started over. This is what happens when you disrespect me! He lifted the axe high above his head and grunted as he brought it down across Sparky's neck. The dog gave one last cry before he was silent forever. Carl was in a rage-induced trance and wouldn't stop hacking at the dog. Sparky's head had fallen into the grass, and he seemed determined to pound the body into mush. Blood splattered Carl's face, the fence around their yard, and the back of the house. Tammy finally got her wits about her and grabbed him from behind. That's enough, Carl. Jesus Christ! Carl felt her arms around him, and he gave in. He allowed Tammy to pull him away from what was left of the dog. Both Nikki and Greg were sobbing now after seeing their beloved pet chopped into pieces. Carl seemed to be in an unconscious state as Tammy led her family into the house. Everyone was scared, but Carl's murderous rage seemed to have subsided. I know you guys are scared, Tammy said to the kids. But you need to go to your bedrooms. I need to talk to your father. She kissed them both on their foreheads and sent them upstairs. Nikki took her little brother into her room, and they lay in her bed together. Neither of them could think of anything to say, so they just hugged each other and cried. Downstairs, Carl still had an ice-cold grip on the axe handle. Tammy had tried to pry his fingers apart and make him drop it, but it was no use. Tammy was scared, but she never believed Carl would hurt her, even after watching what happened to the dog. He was again sitting at the kitchen table and hadn't uttered another word. His eyes moved across all the bills that were still lying there. Tammy put both of her hands on either side of Carl's face and turned his head toward her. She pressed her forehead to his, and some of Sparky's blood smeared onto Tammy's face. It's okay, baby. I don't know what happened, but we can fix this. You have to talk to me, Carl. Something about what Tammy said woke Carl from his trance, and he shoved her backward. <sighs> Don't you fucking tell me what to do, bitch. This is my house. Spittle flew from his mouth onto Tammy, and a strand of drool made a slow descent down his chin. He slowly stood up and methodically walked toward his wife with malicious intent. Nikki and Greg had heard the yelling and sneaked down to the bottom of the stairs in time to see their mother put her hands up and scream. Carl, no, what are you? She couldn't finish her sentence as he brought the axe down on her. The first blow of the axe struck her in the forearm and got stuck. Tammy screamed as Carl put his foot on her face for leverage and pulled the axe out of her arm. He raised it over his head again and drove it into her skull. Blood sprayed everywhere, including the kids watching at the bottom of the stairway. Nikki let loose a blood-curdling scream, and Greg just stood in place, unable to breathe or move. Nikki ran up the stairs as Carl struggled to pull the axe out of Tammy's head. Carl finally had the axe loose and followed, not even acknowledging little Greg just standing there. Nikki shut her bedroom door behind her, but the door didn't have a lock. Carl quickly kicked it open and saw his daughter cowering in the corner. Nikki was about to turn 16. She often talked with her dad about him taking her out to practice driving. He had let her drive around the block a few times, with the understanding that she could not tell her mother. Even though she was only a sophomore in high school, she had been invited to prom by one of the upperclassmen. She was excited and asked Carl if he'd come along when they were shopping. Nikki tried on a multitude of dresses, and when it came time to choose one, she chose the dress that her dad liked the most. 
When she was younger, her dad would tuck her in almost every night after telling her stories and singing her songs. She cowered in the corner as her dad approached, covered in the blood of her mother and dog. She saw no love in his eyes, and he showed no hesitation as he hacked his baby girl to pieces. Greg had forced himself to go back up the stairs with thoughts of trying to save Nikki. Unfortunately, all he could do was stand at the doorway and watch the murder of his sister. Just like with the dog, his father did not stop chopping until her head had been detached from her body. Greg watched as Carl picked up Nikki's head by her hair. He turned and looked at Greg and said, Go to bed, Gregory. It's past your bedtime. Then Carl laid down in his daughter's bed, cuddled her head close to his chest, and fell asleep. It was dark now. Greg and his family had moved all they could into the house for the night. They were all exhausted. They hadn't been able to put the beds together yet, so they all had put their mattresses on the floor of their bedrooms. Greg had just told Carter good night, and he walked across the hall to Cassidy's room. She already had her light off, but he could see the glow from her cell phone, so he peeked his head in. She didn't stop texting to acknowledge her dad. This used to be my bedroom, Cass. You know that? Yes, Dad. You've already told me like eight times already. Looking at it now, it reminds me of these dreams I used to have. I didn't know it at the time, but they're called lucid dreams. It's when you're dreaming, but you're not sure if you're sleeping or awake. <laughs> yeah, Dad. I know what lucid dreams are. I'm not an idiot. Well, you little smartass, let me finish my story. When I would lucid dream, the only way I would know if I was dreaming or awake is I'd walk over to this light here and flip the switch. If I was dreaming, the light never turned on. You better try it, Dad. I mean, what if you're dreaming now? Cassidy said in a mocking tone. Greg said, Kid, I swear you're just like your mother. And flipped the light switch. He flipped it up and down several times, confused as to why the light wasn't working. When he looked back at Cassidy, he could see in the glowing light of her phone that her face was covered in blood and she had a gash on her forehead. What's wrong, Dad? You look like you've seen a ghost. When Greg opened his eyes, he was staring at the severed head of his daughter. He was lying on her mattress, holding it close to him. Carter was standing in the doorway, frozen in horror. I hope you enjoyed Lucid, as written by Buzz Parcher and voiced by Kyle Stroud, Jesse Cornett, Heather Thomas, and Melissa Medina. To find more of Arthur Buzz Parcher, visit simplyscurrypodcast.com slash Parcher, spelled P-A-R-C-H-E-R, and you'll be redirected to his author profile on creepypastastories.com. And don't forget to check out his book, Rotten, on Amazon. Rotten is about time and place, life and death. None of these are absolutes for Igor Rotten. Igor exists between the cracks and crevices of reality, only to infinitely suffer through one horrible life after another. He experiences neglect, sexual abuse, gruesome violence, and so much more. A loving family and a chance at happiness ultimately costs him another lifetime in a purgatory of crippling loss. Thanks to the Grinder Man, his memories of previous lives fade, but the pain and misery is alive and well within the scars of his stitched together soul. From a shitty little town in Ohio, all the way to Armageddon, Igor suffers the worst of what life has to offer over and over again. If you enjoyed Mr. Cornette's performance, you can hear more of him on the Chilling Tales YouTube channel, as well as on the No Sleep podcast, where you can hear his vocal performances as well as production. 
Kyle Stroud's work can be found at his website at kylestroud.com. That's K-Y-L-E-S-T-R-O-U-D dot com. And as a reminder, voice actress Melissa Medina's work can be found on the official YouTube channel of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, as well as on her website, hearmelissa.com. That's H-E-A-R-M-E-L-I-S-S-A dot com. If you enjoyed Heather Thomas's performance, you can hear more of her right here on our official YouTube channel, as well as on the amazing Creepy Podcast, where several of her vocal performances are available for your enjoyment. If you check her out, be sure to give her performances a thumbs up, leave a kind word, and tell her you heard her here on this program and that Steve sent you. It would mean a lot to me. Now... Our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012 and consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams dreams. <laughs>